Listen only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Terry Erzman. I'm the Vice President of Marketing for Citus Data. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, before we get started, uh, I'll just do a little bit of housekeeping here. If you can hear me, please raise your hand in the GoToWebinar uh, control panel. Great. Thanks, everyone. I see hands raised. Appreciate that. Um, <clears throat> if you have any questions during today's webinar, <clears throat> please enter, enter them in the uh, chat window or in, in the chat window in the GoToWebinar, or uh, sorry, in the questions window in the GoToWebinar control panel. And uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll go through as many of those questions as possible. If we have any uh, that we don't have time to answer, then uh, Marco will uh, uh, address those in a, in a blog to follow the webinar. Today's webinar is being recorded, and we will send you a link to the webinar recording and uh, also to the uh, a downloadable version of the slides within the next 24 hours. Uh, with that, I would like to uh, introduce our speaker for today. Marco is a software engineer here at Citus Data, and he's speaking today on parallelizing analytical queries in Postgres. Marco? Thank you, Terry. Uh, so good evening for me. I'm actually in the Netherlands, <clears throat> so it's evening here. Uh, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a software engineer at Citus Data. I uh, used to actually work at Amazon as a software engineer and do a PhD, but now I'm, I'm programming databases for Citus Data. Um, so I guess you're all familiar with, with Citus Data and, and some of our projects to help you scale out PostgreSQL. And so one of them is to actually be able to paralyze analytical queries uh, across a sharded database using uh, Citus DB. So today, today I want to do a bit of a technical dive into how does that actually work. And uh, so first we'll look at basically different ways of sharding a database across a cluster of machines, uh, and particularly range partitioning your data across a cluster and hash partitioning. And then I want to look at the logic behind how queries are parallelized across many machines and cores on those machines. Uh, basically the planning and the execution logic for those queries. Now finally, I, I kind of want to bring those two things together because um, you know, picking different sharding schemes for your database will have some uh, performance implications uh, when you're doing parallel execution. So uh, I want to kind of build some intuition around, uh, around those implications. Um, I'm assuming everyone here is familiar with PostgreSQL. I think two interesting features about PostgreSQL to highlight are the fact that it's very extensible and it's so extensible that you can even um, very easily overwrite the query planning and execution pipeline of PostgreSQL. And that allows you to create certain completely new types of tables which use uh, separate execution planning and execution logic from other types of tables. And in this case, we'll use that to do distributed execution. Um, another interesting feature about PostgreSQL to highlight is the MVCC, multi-version concurrency control, which lets it uh, run queries concurrently very efficiently. So basically each uh, transaction, let's say select, looks at its own version of the database and even you know, updates can run concurrently because uh, without affecting the select. And so there's no locking or synchronization needed between uh, queries, which makes it uh, quite efficient at running many queries concurrently. But uh, an inherent limitation of PostgreSQL is that it only uses, at least of the current version of PostgreSQL, is that it only uses one process per query. And it's also sort of limited to a single server. I mean, you can set up replication, but then you just you know kind of get two copies of of the same database, and then you can still only use one process when you're uh, running a query. So um, a use case we run into quite often is that of analytical dashboards. So basically a way for users to query their data, to look at their data in, in different ways, in kind of an interactive way. And this typically comes from uh, a lot of companies have logs, all sorts of events, logs from different systems, web logs, click streams, logs from sensors, and this is typical. It can be gigabytes a day, it can be terabytes a day, and there's often all sorts of interesting business information in these logs, and you want uh, to be able to see that information in kind of uh, a nice way. So you might want to see uh, 
you know, sales by country or how does sales, how does our sales growing over time in a particular country? What is the busiest day of the week? Like that's all sorts of interesting information. Um, now the trouble with these kind of, let's say business questions is that um, the queries tend to span a large amount of data. So they typically have very simple outputs, like uh, the top one here gives you number of sales group by day. So um, basically uh, this will be input in for a chart, for example, where the x-axis is the date and the y-axis is the number of sales on that date. But to answer this query, the database will have to go through at least all the sales events to get the day, the day for them. And uh, maybe um, if I don't have any indexes, we'll have to go through all the events and then group them, order them, and it's, uh, it's a computationally expensive query. And another type of query, you get the revenue in, in Asia since 2012. So here there's, there's a join, uh, we filter by date, and then finally we only get a, one output value. But again, it it's, can be kind of an expensive query. And so if you're limited to a single core, um, these queries can take a while, but now since we're building a dashboard, we typically want really fast response times. Um, two seconds is probably already too much. Typically we want to update the screen that the user is looking at in a few hundred milliseconds if they change something about you know, the data that they're searching for, if they want to see a different grouping or filtering of the data. We want to update it really quickly. And uh, yet, we have to process a very large amount of data uh, with only a small output, but the, the amount of data to process is, is huge. And worse, uh, it grows a lot over time. You know, we keep adding, getting more log data every day uh, or every hour. Um, and uh, so the data size grows, so our queries get slower over time, but it gets worse because probably the rate at which the data is growing also grows. And that means the queries start doing more work. Start over time, it can get uh, kind of slower and slower. And because you, the user can often you know, look at the data in all sorts of different ways, um, caching and materialized views don't tend to be very, uh, don't tend to be very effective here. So. Fundamentally, we kind of need to distribute uh, the work across many machines and parallelize across many cores, also disks and, and, and memory, uh, just to have the capacity to answer these types of queries uh, quickly. And so, uh, well, CiteDB is a way of doing that for PostgreSQL. So it adds the notion of a distributed table to PostgreSQL, and it's actually sharded across a cluster of worker nodes, which are also PostgreSQL uh, servers. And this helps you actually keep the query times kind of low and also flat, even if your data size is growing, because you can keep at, also keep adding more servers, because it's quite, uh, make, CitusDB kind of makes it easier to do sharding and scaling out. I mean, you could, you, you could do sharding manually where you decide, okay, I'm gonna put, my data in one database and another part of my data in another database, but then handle making your applications aware of those machines, having fault tolerance, and actually doing the querying then becomes uh, becomes a lot of work. Uh, uh, um, but I want to get more than uh, like how does that actually work? How can we query a sharded table in kind of a transparent way with parallelization? So um, 
and uh, this is actually where the data is stored. And this, these are just regular tables. There is nothing special about these tables. You can query them. You can put indexes on them if you want. Um, but they only contain a specific subset of all the data in the distributed table. You will also actually see um, some of these, uh, like you will see this events underscore 10,018 on multiple worker nodes because there's going to be uh, replication. And so uh, a question is, what is actually stored in those tables? How do we decide what gets stored in a certain shard? And so when we make, when we create a distributed table, we need to decide on a particular partitioning scheme. And uh, I think these are kind of the two most common schemes used in, in distributed databases are uh, range partitioning by a partition column, uh, which is basically a range of values will be in a shard. And this is very good for if you want to do bulk loading, like loading a lot of data, at the data into the database at the same time. And uh, but typically would partition by timestamp or, or something like that, but it's, it's not strictly required. You can partition by other things. Um, and then there's hash partitioning by partition column. And this is best if you want to do kind of real-time inserts, updates, deletes, rather than bulk loading. And typically you would partition by uh, some identifier. So when we talk about a shard, it's basically, uh, a shard is like a partition, a part of the data that is stored together on uh, one machine at least, but if there's replication on, on multiple machines. And so this is just a, a partition of our data. And each worker is going to have, uh, basically we say that a shard has multiple placements, which are the replica, and the placements are then tables on the worker nodes. So if we do range partitioning, um, each shard contains uh, rows within a particular range of partition columns values. So when we create the database, or when we create the table, one of our columns uh, we designate as the partition column. And so uh, when we have a shard, uh, let's say the first well, one in this table, it might contain all the values. Uh, let's say our, our partition column is a timestamp. And all the rows in this shard have a timestamp between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. And then the next shard is 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. and so on. And uh, this is a very nice setup if, let's say, we have log data, like every hour we generate uh, a new log file, and we want to bulk load this in, like we want to load this into the database at once, what we can do is just create a new shard because remember shards are stored as tables and copying data into a table in PostgreSQL is uh, is very fast. So um, and even if you have you know multiple log files for the same hour you could for example append it to an existing uh, shard so it, it's also quite fast. And I'll uh, actually so to give you a feel for what would this what's the user experience of creating a range partition table specifically for CytusDB, um, you would have a create table like you usually would with an extra suffix, which is uh, distributed by append, and then you specify the partition column. So this is the, the timestamp. And then to load data into the database, you can use the stage command, uh, which is just like the copy command, but it also does replication and it kind of applies to distributed tables. And so you can take a log file and stage that into the database, add that to the database. And this is a, a pretty fast command. It's actually not as fast as copy because of the replication, but um, you can scale this out across a cluster as well uh, because the, the data doesn't have to go through, uh, through the master. Now, the alternative is to, uh, to hash partition a table. And... Uh, the way to think of hash partitioning is, well, given a, a row, let's say a new row that we want to add to the database, we can look at what is the value in the partition column for that row, take a hash using some hash function which is appropriate for that data type, and uh, so let's say the partition column value is 6, we take the hash that gives us some really big number, but anyway, we've actually at the start when we made our hash partition table, we've created a bunch of shards 
and in this case, the min value and the max value for each shard actually covers the entire range of integers. So for any output of the hash function will fall into one of these ranges. So in this case, uh, our item might fall into events underscore 10,020. And so for any given partition column value, I can decide on which, on which shard to put it in. And uh, this makes hash partitioning particularly nice for inserts. Because if you, if you think about range partitioning, um, like not all uh, possible partition column values are covered by all the ranges because um, you know the, the current time might not have, have a range yet. So I'd have to create that first if I wanted to do uh, the insert. But for hash, I can also do always do an insert. So uh, again, to give you a feel for what that means as a user, uh, now you'll notice that the syntax here is a bit different. Uh, because we kind of developed this separately in uh, the open source PG shard extension. And uh, first you create a regular table, then you can uh, create a turn that into a distributed table where you specify the partition column, which in this case I'm going to pick the user ID. Now as I said, you have to create the shards at the start in this case. Um, so, and this function will actually create 16 shards, so divide uh, the integer ranges, uh, the integers into 16 ranges, and uh, two means actually the replication factor, so each shard will have two replicas. And after I've done that, I can immediately um, start inserting data into the events table with, um, well, if user ID is six, I'm, you know, We'll take the in the background. We'll take the hash of six and then decide where to put it based on that. Um, and so I'm using some like uh, very often if you have some some table that, that keeps track of events, like different events can have different properties. So I'm using the the JSON B data type for that. Um, now hash partitioning is not so good for bulk loading because basically if I have a log file. For every row in the log file, uh, we'll have to separately, or CitusDB will have to separately decide where that row goes, which shard that row goes into. So there's actually a lot of work per row uh, compared to uh, bulk loading, which you could do in range partitioning. So hash partitioning ends up being better if you want to do real-time inserts and updates and deletes, whereas range partitioning is, is uh, better when you want to do bulk load a lot of data in, into the uh, database at once. So there's, they have some different uh, properties, but we'll see some more different properties when we start talking about uh, you know, parallelization. Um, so, but first I want to look at actually how does parallelization work? How can we take a query on the distributed table on the master node and then uh, you know, chop it into pieces that we can parallelize? So, um, this is kind of the situation I've described so far. We have a master node with uh, a, a distributed table that you know a user or an application can query, and then uh, there are worker nodes which store uh, the shards in that table as regular uh, as regular PostgreSQL tables. Now, as I said, you can you can log into these workers and query these tables, and um, that's exactly what the master is going to do as well. So when the master gets a distributed table, it actually starts connecting to the workers and running uh, multiple queries on all those different uh, shards, basically. Um, there's more or less two ways of doing that. Um, one would be to bring the data to the computation, and this is commonly applied in, in, in databases. Um, so basically, we could the master could pull even all the data into one sort of temporary table and then run the query that it got. Uh, that would be one implementation. Maybe it only gets the price column for this particular query and then computes the sum of the price. But in this case, I mean, there's a lot of network traffic from the workers to the master to send over all that data. And there's no real parallelization because the master still uses only a single core. So uh, typically, the better way of doing this is, uh, if I can get my, is bring the computation to the data. 
So actually, we don't need to pull all the data from the shards. Actually, if we ask uh, each worker node, can you please give me the sum for the shards or the sums for the shards that you store? Then uh, what the master will get back is a bunch of sums, which is not the answer to the query. But then it can sum up the sums, which gives you the overall sum. And it can give back that back to the user. And so now the sum uh, of each shard can be computed by each worker separately. So the work is being done down there in, on the workers. And actually, if, uh, if a worker has multiple shards, it can also use multiple cores on, on the same worker. Um, but now, how do we do this kind of correctly for any given query? Uh, how do we make that translation such that A, we push as much work down to the workers, and uh, B, we get, get the correct final result? So um, now for that, let's look at a slightly more interesting query. So uh, well, the one we've seen before, let's get the sum of the prices in the orders tables, which essentially gets us the revenue uh, since uh, 2012 in Asia. Okay, doesn't matter whether it's a super useful query, but uh, we'll, we'll use it for this example. So what PostgreSQL does, if you, uh, if you get a query like this on a normal table, it builds kind of a logical plan, uh, kind of a tree of relation of uh, kind of which is kind of a relational algebra. And to make this a uh, that that plan that tree a distributed uh, query, what we can do is we add these collect nodes. And what the collect nodes will do is it will take all the shards in the uh, in the distributed table and put them into one place on, on, on the master nodes, like in one table, and then we can do the join and the filter and the project and the sum. Uh, now obviously this is not, uh, this is actually the first approach. This is bringing the data to the computation. But it is correct. We know that it is sort of, um, you know, we'll give the right result. Now what we do actually is we start with this plan and then uh, we kind of look at the the math of the of, of the relational algebra. So we look for operators uh, in in the tree that are commutative. So commutativity is like a plus b is b plus a. So you can swap them around and it's still the same result. Similarly, you could uh, you know you could first collect all of the data in a table and then do a projection and take a take one or more pick a few of the columns. Or you could first do the projection on the worker node and then collect the results. Mathematically, it's the same. The math doesn't care. But as a database designer, the one on the right is much faster. Because now, actually, I'm pulling way less data over the network. And part of the work is being done by the worker. Uh, similarly, with joins, I can apply kind of the distributive property that collecting uh, table X and then collecting table Y and then doing a join is more or less the same as collecting uh, X joined with Y. So uh, applying these rules to our, uh, our distributed query tree on the left, we can often pull the collect all the way to the top. Now sometimes we need to do a little extra. You'll see that um, on the left we had a sum node and we've actually transformed this into two sum nodes. And one we will be able to push down below to collect, and the other one will actually sum the intermediate sums. And so then um, the bottom part of the tree is actually something we're, we can apply to each uh, shard in the distributed table. And the top part in the tree, uh, I mean, and we can let, collect the results of those those uh, those queries, and then. The top part of the tree is something we can apply on the result of that, and that will give us the, uh, the correct response to the query. So what this will look like in practice is there is a, a third step to planning, which is uh, physical planning. So we can take the top part of our logical plan and turn it into a query that we will run on the master on some temporary table. Now the bottom part of the query, we will turn into a query that we will run on the worker because there's kind of a one-to-one -one mapping between uh, query plans and, and SQL. 
So we can turn, take a query plan data structure and tur turn it back into SQL. Um, now I'm ignoring something here or, or haven't mentioned something here is that there's actually a join going on here now between each of the shards of orders with, uh, with, the nation, with a shard from the nation table. So I'm kind of making an assumption here that uh, maybe nation table is probably a very small table. There's maybe 200 nations in the world. So we can afford to uh, basically replicate this table to all the worker nodes. Or even if we don't do that, if you run a query like this inside SDB, uh, all the worker nodes would pull that small table to all the worker nodes such that we can do uh, can join each shard individually with the, the one shard in the nation table. Uh, and that's sort of a, a requirement for being able to push down the joins. Uh, there's other cases in which we can do, we have bigger tables, but we can join them shard by shard, or like in pairs of shards if they're partitioned along in the same way. Sometimes uh, we need to do a little extra, which and <laughs> because maybe we're joining by a key which is not uh, a partition key. In that case, we need to repartition the table before we can uh, do the join. Um, now this is uh, so. This is kind of I don't want to talk too much about joins and talk more about parallelization. Uh, it's also not something we typically see a lot because it's actually not very fast because you need to pull a lot of data over the network. So we try to avoid repartition joins. So uh, basically, the output of the physical planning stage will be a bunch of worker queries to run on the workers, and then one query to run on the master afterwards. So then, at this point, doing parallel execution is actually quite simple. Uh, what the master is going to do is it's going to connect to the worker nodes and then send all these queries in parallel uh, using separate connections. And each time we open a new connection, basically PostgreSQL starts a new process that will uh, process this query. And so all these different queries that make up the distributed query will run in parallel. And the results will be collected in a merge table on the master. Now if there's any failure, um, it's also quite simple. This query, uh, like the orders 109 chart, will be placed on uh, multiple worker nodes. So if the first one fails, we can just fail over to the second one. And the user will not even have to know that uh, a worker node might have failed. So finally, uh, once we have all the results, the master can uh, run the query on the merge table and uh, give back the result to the user. So this part is sequential, but it's usually quite small. And so, yeah, we get, basically, we exploit the fact that, um, you know, PostgreSQL is very good at running multiple queries in parallel. So we translate one query into many queries and get a uh, nice parallelization for that from a single distributed query. And as I said, it gets a bit more complicated for repartition joins because there's then dependencies between tasks. But in most cases, this is, um, this is how the queries are executed. So then um, the question is, how fast is this really? And uh, I especially want to look at kind of understanding the performance, like what, what matters uh, to performance. Well, the, the basic intuition that you might have of uh, the execution time of a sort of distributed query or a parallel query is that um, it's bounded by kind of the slowest task, so the slowest query on the worker, uh, plus some network and management overhead, plus the master query time. Uh, which is usually quite small, but like the slowest task is quite fundamental to how fast our overall distributed query is going to run. Uh, and so if data is not evenly distributed in the shards, or the, at least the data that our query needs to process, then the parallelization becomes less effective. Like one of the tasks will be still be, will be running for a while while others very quickly finish. So data distribution matters. Uh, partitioning also matters. How we actually partitioned our data, how we, uh, what, what goes into the shards. So let's say we did, uh, we did range partitioning by the hour, and now we have a particular query that uh, queries uh, basically filters for a particular day. It's interested in the data for a particular day. Now we have one shard per hour, 
So that gives us 24 shards to query. So we'll and basically have 24 processes and thus use 24 cores, which, uh, which may be a lot. It's certainly more than one. Uh, maybe we have way more cores in our system so that we might want to use. So then maybe uh, this partitioning scheme will not allow us to, to do that. Um, but it, it depends a lot on the query. Like different queries get different uh, performance profiles, if you will. And uh, also just the cluster setup and also the shard count uh, matters. Uh, I mean, it's not just the number of cores, also the number of disks, the amount of memory, uh, the I.O. bandwidth. But some basic intuition uh, is to say, well, if the number of tasks is less than the number of cores, then uh, you will not use all the cores. If you have, you know, if you can use 24 cores because there's 24 hours, but you have 100, then you will not be able to use the other uh, 76. If you have uh, more tasks than cores, you might end up with uh, tasks competing for cores. Uh, so some some of them might run a little slower than they would if there was no competition. But this is a, usually a good situation to be in. Because then, you know, first your your operating system can do scheduling between these tasks, and then also uh, at this point when you have more tasks than cores and they're all doing a lot of work, uh, you can decide maybe to add a new machine to your cluster. So um, I want to look at finally look at some examples of uh, of queries and kind of think about. What will this? What is the implication of using a certain type of uh, partitioning scheme? So uh, this query is it's similar to what I had at the start, except I added uh, so get the number of sales group by day, except I added a particular user. I want to see this for user six. And then so the question is, how much data per shard do I really need to read, even if I have like indexes, um, like there's some minimum amount of information that I will still need to read basically all the sales events for uh, that particular user. Now, in this case, if I had hash partitioned my table by user ID, um, this will not work nicely because, I mean, the hash of the user ID is always going to be the same. So all my data for my user ID for this user will be in the same shard. So in this case, there's actually, uh, for hash partitioning by user ID, there's actually no parallelization. I will just use uh, a single core and a single worker node, which might still be a good thing, you know, because uh, I can still run a lot more queries in parallel if I have, you know, a whole cluster of worker nodes rather than just one node. But uh, I don't get, my queries don't get a lot faster in that sense. Uh, had I range partition by the hour, uh, I do get a uh, nice kind of parallelization, but I, I should probably consider that some hours of the day are going to be a bit busier than other hours of the day. So maybe at 8 p.m. I have way more sales than at 4 a.m. Um, and so this is going to be kind of a bound on my uh, distributed execution time because that's the slowest going to be the slowest task. Um, and uh, a completely different alternative would be to say something different, like let's let's hash partition by hour, or even something else. But in this case, uh, we actually get a quite a nice even distribution of uh, the amount of data in each shard that I need to process. Um, there's other reasons why you might not want to hash partition by hour, but actually for performance, it's uh, it's quite good for this particular query. Now, one thing that does happen, though, actually, I, I said, so a reason why you might not want to hash partition by hour is, for example, because you cannot do bulk loading very quickly by in hash partitioning, so it might not make that much sense. Um, now, at some point, as I said, your data size is going to grow. Now, what tends to happen in hash partitioning is that the shards grow. What tends to happen in range partitioning is that there's going to be more shards. Uh, so these are kind of two different ways in which your database evolves over time, basically. And so the, the first case gets really bad now, for partitioning by user ID, whereas range partitioning 
doesn't get worse at all because we, you know, the slowest task is still the same. Uh, whereas hash partition by hour now, you know, your queries kind of get slower over time. Um, but I mean, it's still very evenly distributed across the cores. So it's still both of them are both range partitioning and hash partitioning by hour performance-wise would be a good choice. But with range partitioning, you get uh, better, faster bulk loading. Um, so let's let's actually look at uh, another one, very similar. So now we've removed the uh, the user ID filter. So we're now going to get the number of sales groups by ID for everyone. This is actually the uh, the query that I had in the examples at the start. And I'm especially showing this because now if we think about the hash partition by user ID case, um, the, the drawback disappears. We're no longer stuck in a single shard. Actually, our data will be uh, distributed across all the shards somewhat evenly. Uh, like you might have some very big users, customers that, uh, you know, cause slight offsets, but uh, generally it will be, you know, for almost almost the same query, uh, we, we get a very different performance profile in if we have partitioning by user ID. It's now, much, it's now just as fast as the other two options. Well, actually range partitioning by hour is still a bit worse here because we have some hours that are busier. Um, and so let's let's look at another one. Um, this is just gets me the, the sales events in the morning. I think I, I fabricated some syntax here, but um, so how much data per shard do I have to read now? Um, well, if I had hash partition by user ID, um, and assuming I get sales from many different users, whatever that means, um, my data will be evenly distributed across the shards. Now, if I had range partitions by the hour, um, all my data from between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m. will be in uh, two shards. And so the parallelization I get here is uh, worse than in the case on the, uh, when hash partitioning by user ID. Also hash partitioning by hour, and I'm going to see the same thing. So um, if you have this type of query a lot, maybe hash partitioning by user ID would be a good choice. But actually, there are other issues. Um, and one I can think of is, uh, let's say, your disk seek time. If you, uh, you know, hash partition by user ID and your data is stored in eight different shards, and let's say this is a single machine, maybe the machine has two disks, and, okay, so let's assume nothing is cached, then to get these um, data from these eight shards, I'd have to do at least eight seeks, on my, and on my two disks, that is going to take at least, let's say, 40 milliseconds, uh, if I'm assuming just regular hard disk drives. Whereas if I had range partitioned my data by the hour, all the data from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. is going to basically be stored together because when I create my shard, especially in range partitioning, um, you know, I just copy a file into a table directly, so it's going to be one big block on disk. Um, and if I had hash partitioned my hour, hopefully also it's going to be stored pretty close to each other. So which one is the winner here uh, is not quite clear to me because uh, and, and especially because the data size is kind of small, so seek time starts because we're you know we're only looking at let's say this morning 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, and so even though we get better parallelization in one case across the cores, in another case uh, we might see you know, <coughs> uh, better seek times on disk. Uh, so there's there's a couple of different. Um, you know, things that could happen here, and it depends a bit on how many shards do we have, how many how many cores, what is the, you know, the nature of the data, um, which one is actually going to be the fastest. So sometimes it's, it's hard to predict. Now, um, there, um, basically when you need to decide on your, uh, sh your sharding scheme, so uh, 
performance is one issue. Um, it, being able to do inserts is another issue. Being able to bulk load is another issue. Okay, sorry, it took a while for my slide to switch. Um, and um, so basically, you need to decide these things at the start because you know when you start building out your cluster, it's it's very hard to change your partitioning scheme uh, later on. Uh, another you know consideration not mentioned explicitly, if you need to do co-located join or if you need to do joins, you kind of want them to be co-located, which means that you try to the two tables you want to join you try to partition them in the same way and store the shards that need to be joined together. Um, and so that might also be an, a consideration that you need to make when you do pick range or hash partitioning. So the, those are kind of more functional considerations. Um, so we looked at parallel execution logic of, of a way of translating a, a, a query on a distributed table on a master node into multiple queries on worker nodes uh, using this kind of logical planning and then looking at commutativity rules to be able to push down computation to the workers or as much of the computation to the workers as possible. Um, and uh, basically, if you put those two things together, um, you, you'll see that you'll need to look at to, to determine how fast your query will actually run, you'll need to look at like data distribution, uh, how is my data partitioned, what is the setup of my cluster. Uh, all those things kind of go into what kind of parallel query performance will you end up seeing. Um, I see I have a bit of time left. I wanted to just give you a little uh, feature preview, which could be kind of interesting. Uh, because it kind of nicely shows some of the things I explained, and it's actually explained. So this is something we're adding to uh, post to Citus DB at the moment. So uh, I told you we have a distributed. So basically here we talk about the distributed query, which is the part that happens on the worker node, and we're putting uh, the results of this distributed query into uh, a merge job table. And the distributed query consists of six tasks, and the tasks are actually the queries that run on the worker nodes. And so the worker nodes, uh, this actually shows the plan of the query on the worker nodes. And so there's these six tasks, and at the end we do a master query, which um, you know does a, essentially a scan of the merge table, and then sort and then limit because this query basically took the ten most recent uh, customer reviews from from a, for a particular customer, and so this kind of nicely shows like the um, you have to basically first you do all the tasks on the workers those happen in parallel, and then finally do, you do a master query. And in this case, we are doing uh, you know an order by and a limit. So actually, what ends up happening is we push the limit and the order by down to the worker. So basically, we get the 10 most recent reviews from each uh, shard in, in the cluster. And then finally, we, that gives us uh, 60 rows, basically. And then we sort those on the master and take the 10 most recent ones over there. Um, so back to my slides. And yep, there they are. Um, well. I don't have more slides uh, to leave time for questions, so um, I over to Terry. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Mark, we have a few questions. Again, for uh, anyone in the audience, if you'd like to submit a question, please do so through the GoToWebinar panel now, and we'll get to as many of these as we can. So the uh, first question is, is there a way I can see which partition holds, a specific, holds specific data? Where are those table suffixes coming from? Um, yeah, so maybe I could attempt a live demo of that as well. Uh, now, it might be that my desktop setup is, is pretty messy. But basically, we just use the um, catalog tables in, in uh, PostgreSQL, where we've added a new catalog table. And this shows us basically 
for a, uh, a given table, this is kind of the logical identifier of a table, uh, has a particular shard and uh, then it lists the minimum value and the maximum value of the data in that shard. So the table I showed you before in my slides is pretty much exists as a catalog table on the master node of CytosDB. And there is, for example, another um, table which is the placement table which says, oh, this shard has, um, you know, is placed on, well, this is my desktop, so it's local host uh, with port number 9700 and there's another one for 9701. So these are just stored in, in catalog tables, basically, and you can interact with these tables and, and write scripts around these tables if you want to. Okay, uh, next question. Um, do range partitions have a max value to catch all values above the ranges similar to Oracle partitioning? Um, no, they do not. Right now in CytosDB, they, uh, there's, it's all bounded. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, a limitation there that uh, if you do an insert on a range that is not caught by uh, like like a shard without a maximum value, then uh, inside is DB it actually just fails. So you have to create the shard first before you can do the insert on, on the range. Okay, next question. Um, how does the average function work with a distributed query? That's a very good question. So. Um, with sums, it's obvious that uh, we can, you know, take a sum of the sums, and with also with min, we can take the minimum of the minimums. With average, we cannot take the average of the averages. So what we do is uh, we transform average nodes into basically a sum and a count that we push down to the worker, and in the end, then the master takes the sum of the sums and divides it by the sum of the counts to get the, the overall average. Um, so for different aggregates, there's some different logic around how to push them down uh, to the worker. And, and for average, uh, I mean, we need to, we need to get the weight or the number of items in each uh, in each shard that the average is based on. Okay. Uh, next question um, is: Explain available in PG Shard. Uh, in other words, is it open sourced as well? If not, are there any plans to open source it? Um, it's not yet available. Um, and yes, we're definitely going to add explain uh, to PG Chart in, let's say, the next couple of months. Okay, very good. Uh, is there any reason why tasks are number two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and not one, two, three, four, five, six? Um, there are some intermediate tasks that uh, kind of are part of the logic, just the, the sort of logical planning stage, which are later pruned away because in this case we don't need to do them. So it's more of an internal uh, affair, basically, uh, the, the task numbering. Um, like you're not, so this is not the, uh, so we're adding, ex this is, we're developing explain at the moment, uh, we're adding it to the next release. But um, so we might even change that numbering for the explain planet there. But there's no specific reason why they're numbered this way other than internal implementation uh, details. Okay. Uh, you said some shards are replicated. What is the replication algorithm? Um, so in the list of worker nodes uh, that, you know, or the configuration of the worker nodes, you can specify kind of a rack, and uh, when you stage data into, uh, well, in general, when you create a shard, either because you're setting up a hash partition table or uh, you're staging data into a table and creating a new shard that way, uh, like, at least for the second replica, it will try to, uh, basically the first replica will kind of, by default, be round robin. We actually have some different policies for placing shards. You can also pick the machine that you want to place it on. And then for the second replica, it will try to, if you have specified racks, it will try to specify a, uh, a different rack or just pick one kind of randomly from, from the other nodes. Um, so it's, there's kind of a round robin scheme to how shards are placed if you don't specify where you want to have them. Uh, but it, and you can make it kind of rack aware if you if you want to. This is kind of optional. 
Okay, uh, let's see, a question about uh, SciSDB behavior and uh, how it varies with different data models. How well does SciSDB scale when we use a complex relational fully normalized model as opposed to a model such as a star schema? Uh, um, so, well, what, what happens very often if you have, let's say, a heavily normalized table with, with uh, lots of 1 to n or n to n relationships, uh, you need to do uh, kind of joins that go across the whole cluster. So basically, uh, you have a shard on worker A, and the rows in that shard will have to be joined with, with rows on, uh, in a different shard on worker B. And so we'll actually have, if you join those tables together, uh, they might have to be repartitioned such that um, all the data that in, in table A that needs to be joined with data in table B, all that data is moved to the same place uh, where we can apply just a, a regular join. Um, so that process is typically not uh, not super fast compared to, let's say, uh, normal queries because um, there's a lot of data flowing over the network. So it does scale, but it for the use case of analytical dashboards where you want to answer within, let's say, one or two seconds, um, you know, you typically want to avoid doing that. If you have, say, a, a more of a reporting use case, a data warehouse use case, where you have uh, 10 seconds, 60 seconds, or even longer, um, then you can do those types of queries. And it will parallelize them across the whole cluster. Um, the repartitioning is, is, is quite efficient. But um, it's, it's something we typically try not to do when we're doing kind of analytical dashboard where we really need to have the results in a few hundred milliseconds. Okay, uh, next question. Um, which features of traditional relational databases does CytusDB support in view of its distributed nature? Features such as constraints and table triggers. Um, it, uh, it's, let's say it's a glass is half full of uh, approach, so we need to implement uh, every re-implement every feature. So constraints um, are actually very hard to implement because you know one shard uh, is not going to be aware of data that's in another shard on another worker. So then we need to actually in those cases we actually need to make the concessions that well we we don't support foreign keys and probably we never will because the overhead of supporting them would just be quite quite large, um, and and so, I mean, we could support them like optionally, but then the use cases that we kind of developing for are more kind of, you know, I want my result really fast, and then often foreign keys are, are not so much an option. Uh, so we don't have those. Um, we support mostly like more, more basic queries, um, like I think, don't think we have tr table triggers, but at least not on the distributed table. What, well, what is nice is that because the worker nodes just have, uh, you know, the data is just stored in regular tables, you can do anything you want with them. So you can set up triggers on those tables. You can set up views on those tables. You can uh, do with those tables whatever you can do with the PostgreSQL tables. And also, obviously, indexes you can have on, on those tables. Um, so not all features are kind of directly supported on uh, distributed tables or in a distributed way, but actually most of what you need out of those features you can get by putting it in in the workers. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, like if you if if you wanted to have like say a trigger on a worker node for a sharded table when you do an insert, uh, you you can easily do that, um, and so you can also locally roll up one table into another. Uh, if you wanted that. So there's a lot of PostgreSQL features that are not completely, like, don't have a distributed implementation are actually available just just uh, on the worker nodes. And it can be slightly harder to use them because of the distributed nature, but, um, you know, it's you can script it using the catalog tables, for example. Okay, uh, next question. Is it possible to shard on a composite key? Uh, yes, this this is possible. Um, 
basically, uh, one thing that CytusDB wants is there, uh, when you put a new shard into the data, like you're doing range partitioning and you put a new shard into the database, it will want a uh, kind of to see what is the minimum and what is the maximum value of the data you just put in to you know, specify the range. And uh, I think if you create, use a composite key, you actually need to specify also a min and a max function for that composite key. Um, I think otherwise PostgreSQL kind of comes up with its own uh, ordering. So there, uh, you need to do a little extra. You need to create those functions to correctly use composite keys. But otherwise, yeah, there's, there's no uh, uh, issue using them. Okay, very good. Um, it looks like uh, we're about at the end of time now. Um, uh, once again, today's uh, webinar was recorded. We'll send a link to the recording uh, here shortly, as well as a link to the slides. And uh, I'll send uh, all the questions that we received to Marco for his uh, review. And if it uh, makes sense, uh, he may follow up with a blog post as well. Uh, thanks, everyone. Have a good day. All right. Thanks for me, too. And have a good morning or evening, wherever you are.